Hi, I'm Val Hart in San Antonio, Texas, founder of Val Hart and Friends at ValHart.com. Welcome to The Real Dr. Doolittle Show, the show for animals and the people who love them. I've been called a real-life Dr. Doolittle many times in my career as an expert animal communicator, behaviorist, pet psychic, and master healer. My mission and passion is to improve the lives of animals the world over by helping humans learn how to speak their language, how to understand their viewpoints, and heal. After all, our love of animals helps us be better humans, and the more balanced and healthy we are, the more balanced and healthy they can be, too. Be sure and look for my CDs on iTunes, and to find out more about my work and to receive your free Quick Start Animal Talk course, just go to my website at valhart.com. While you're there for a limited time, you can also apply for a complimentary Happy Animal Assessment Session. And if you want to learn how to be your own Dr. Doolittle, check out the world's first complete animal communication made easy system available now on my website at valhart.com. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Val Hart, the real Dr. Doolittle, and today I'm talking with Bria Anson. She's a certified advanced Rolfer and Rolf movement practitioner with over 30 years of experience. She's the author of Rolfing, Stories of Personal Empowerment, and is the producer of a children's video, Growing Right with Rolfing. Bria is a pioneer in the field of Rolfing structural integration for animals and has a private practice in St. Paul, Minnesota. In March 2011, she published her latest book called Animal Healing, The Power of Rolfing Structural Integration. She's a pioneer who has taken this transformative body work for humans and is applying it to animals all over the world with amazing results. Uh, her website is briaansonrolfing-animalhealing.com. That's B-R-I-A-H-A-N-S-O-N-R-O-L-F-I-N-G-AnimalHealing.com. If you want to go check that out now while we're talking, that would be great. Okay, so let's talk about the book. In Animal Healing, The Power of Rolfing Structural Integration, Bria presents over three dozen profiles and 170 photographs of 56 different animals as they experience the rolfing process. Any animal suffering from movement limitations resulting from injury, disease, surgical trauma, and even old age experience relief and recovery. And I know that if you enjoy animal stories as much as I do, you're in for a really great read. You'll witness the health and happiness of these animals being transformed through the hands and heart of Bria Anson and her passionate application of Rolfing. It's an incredible menagerie of stories, too, with cats and dogs and horses. She's worked on guinea pigs, llamas, eagles, an owl, a rooster, a cougar. Perhaps most, intri- most intriguing of, of all is an up-close-and-personal encounter with a wild moose named Mike, and I can't wait to hear your stories, Bria. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Val. Great, thanks. So give us a, an, uh, an introduction to our topic here, which is Rolfing Structural Integration. What is that? Well, Rolfing is a system of soft tissue manipulation that was developed by a Dr. Ida P. Rolf. Okay. And um, Ida was born in the, in the end of the last century, okay. actually in the 1890s, okay. and was per- I think she was about the first woman to go to Columbia Medical School. So by 1920, she had her Ph.D. in uh, biological chemistry or biochemist Mm -hmm. and uh, went on to do uh, research at the Rockefeller Institute in the Department of Chemotherapy. And uh, then in, in the early 1920s, she went on and studied mathematics and atomic physics in Zurich. And also on the weekends, it was said that she studied intensely all the material about homeopathy. So this was a a brilliant woman who had um, issues with her own structure, Mm -hmm. and because of that, she knew the early founders of chiropractic and osteopathy. She was a terrific fan of yoga. Oh. And um, there are stories that would say that these yogis would come to New York and that Ida could correct their postures, their asanas. So she, wow. we learned early on that Ida was gifted in terms of having 
almost what you would call an x-ray vision into the body. Mm. And she just was um, one of those geniuses of the last century who started really putting together and looking at how is it that bodies work and why don't they work and what is it that can truly be done to affect the whole structure. Wow. So this was her gift. I I think it took her about 40 years to develop this body of work. And by the 1950s, she was teaching the work. Even in the 40s, she was traveling across the country trying to teach her art to medical doctors and old osteopaths and chiropractors. But she quit doing that because she found that they were just trying to take pieces of her work Mm -hmm. and apply techniques. And in the process, they were taking bodies apart instead of dealing with the whole structure. Oh, okay. Wow. Whew. So I love that. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. What a life. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into it? What happened with you? Well, I um, grew up in Costa Rica. Oh, okay. And was born there and lived there for the first almost 18 years of my life and grew up having horses and dogs and birds and everything around and also grew up being quite the athlete, you know, I was a national golf champion in Costa Rica and Central America and wow. tennis champion and was preparing also to, um, you know, swim in the Olympics uh, before I left. Wow. So there, these, these were all the things that I was interested in, including ballet, which I started at age eight. And my... My trajectory at that point was of becoming a professional golfer. Mm -hmm. But when my family moved to the United States and and my father's business uh, went through some major trauma, that's why we left uh, Mm -hmm. Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. But it it really shook my foundation in terms of really thinking about how could I make a valuable contribution in the world instead of just going around playing golf. Mm-hmm. professionally. Mm-hmm. And so that put me on a whole journey of studying philosophy and sociology and religion courses and um, really thinking about what is the human potential. And I would say that my whole course through college and graduate school where I got a master's in counseling and then worked in universities for about 12 years working with students and working with their development uh, doing Dean of Residential Life kind of work um, at Penn State and uh, Colorado College and then the University of Minnesota Morris, mm-hmm. I was constantly thinking about how can I help people better? And in the uh, early 70s, I started attending month-long workshops like with Carl Rogers and Encounter Work, uh, looking into Gestalt work, uh, looking at imagery and you know, um, hypnosis, these kinds of things, and working. I did a 30-day workshop with Ann Wilson Shave, and it was a process feminist therapist. And that's where I worked through some of my own personal issues and realized that there was a profession out there that could integrate all of my training, all of my experience with bodies, with movement, with grace in the body that could really help people. So that's when I made the decision to become a rolfer. And this was back in the uh, 1977. So this was back in the day where there was hardly a rolfer around. There Mm -hmm. were very, very few. Yeah. And there were very few women in particular being trained at that that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's my beginning. Wow. Wow. So can you tell us a story about what happened to you when you were getting into doing this? I can't, it just it seems fascinating to me. You would have done all of this to get you to this point, um, and then all of a sudden you launch into it, and you were, like you said, one of the very few women, um, and, and you were so guided to do this and so perfectly prepared for the work. Mm-hmm. I feel that, you know, I've been a Buddhist for almost 40 years, and for those first five years, I had been really chanting to find a profession that would integrate 
all of my skills and abilities. So I feel that I was really spiritually driven. And You're, yeah. once, once I heard from a practitioner, you know, a, a woman who was part of Carl Rogers' mm-hmm. training staff about her experience with rolfing, it's almost as if the kernel, the, the seed was planted for me in my own time to then come to this realization. Yeah. Yes. And you listened to your heart and you followed your guidance and your passion. Mm-hmm. And look what you've done with it. Wow. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Oh, so let's talk about um, how and why rothing actually works and how do you apply it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So this process of rothing, it's, it's a whole system of soft tissue manipulation where, you know, a rolfer is, is using their hands to gently guide and manipulate all the soft tissues. In other words, everything that's not bone, mm-hmm. that is the territory of rolfing. Mm. And we're doing this in a, in a very, you know, with human, with our human subjects, you know, what we call the basic 10 series or a series of 10 to 13 sessions that are designed to sequentially bring the major segments of the body into alignment with gravity. And the reason I'm talking first about people is so that in the audience, people can apply this to themselves. Good. One of the principles that Ida said was that as she looked at human structure, you know, and and bodies walking around, one of the things she noticed is that we, as a, she said, as a species of people, we have not yet evolved to the upright position. Mm-hmm. You know, typically there's, we just don't have the strength and the support in the lumbar mm-hmm. structure. She saw the pelvis being tipped forward or back. And as a result, she saw this myriad of compensations of parts of the body twisting and turning to compensate for that. Okay. So one of the principles is that I just said, we really don't yet have a balanced body. We have what she called the random body. Mm. So rolfing is is a very deliberate system where the rolfer is truly working with principles of science and art and bringing them together so that we can sculpt the body into alignment with gravity. That's another very, very important principle. <clears throat> that Ida said that in order to fix a neck that has chronic issues or a low back or a knee or whatever symptom is going on in the human or the, I would say, the animal, mm-hmm. you have to first balance that whole body to itself. We've got to balance all the planes of tissue. We've got to get both sides of the body symmetrical, top and bottom symmetrical, put length in the body and just organize the whole structure, so that then it can be supported in the gravity field. And that's another very, very key principle, that in rolfing, we're not going after fixing symptoms. We're looking at the whole picture and then addressing those symptoms in that way. Okay. Got it. Wow. So let's talk about the variety of applications that rolfing applies Two, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, there, there's a whole, just the list for animals and for people, I would say, is, is the same. I mean, the chronic aches and pains okay. that people experience, particularly as they get older. Okay. And, and there's a favorite quote of mine that I really want to share with the audience. Okay. It was by Ida, and I think it summarizes it so well. She said, some individuals may perceive their losing fight with gravity as a sharp pain in their back, others as the unflattering contour of their body, others as a constant fatigue, yet others as an unrelentingly threatening environment. Mm -hmm. Those over 40 may call it old age, Mm -hmm. and yet all these signals may be pointing to a single problem so prominent in their own structure as well as others that it has been ignored. They are off balance. They are at war with gravity. And that's by Ida P. Rolfe. But to me, that truly says what it is. Because 
most of the problems that you would find in an adult animal, you know, human or mm-hmm. otherwise, yeah. those patterns, if you really understand structure, are there even in the infants. I mean, wow. it's, it's okay. as basic as a mother, you know, whether it be a, an animal or, you know, a human, not having enough room in the womb to carry the baby appropriately. So already in the womb, that structure is being shaped around the limitations of that container. Mm, okay. You, know, you think of a dog and, and also, you know, that they're giving birth to many puppies. Mm-hmm. and how some come out with a really good structure, others don't, some are really mashed up, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the imprint, the blueprint, really gets going. Wow. Plus you add the evolutionary piece, the birthing process, and then you look at how we pattern ourselves after our parents, and that shapes our body in terms of holding patterns, mm-hmm. how we move, then injuries that we get just from, you know, even falling off a swing or yeah, falling yeah. off our bike, that starts contracting the, the connective tissue of the body. Mm-hmm. And that's another really important part of rolfing is that we are working directly with the myofascial system of the body or the fascia. Mm-hmm. Know, the, okay. And I might want to say something about that because it's, such a key component to rolfing, and it differentiates it from so many other systems of body work. Okay. And just so that the listeners know, this myofascial or fascial system, you know, it kind of encapsulates and envelops and it attaches and, and it supports and relates all the body components. And it's very adaptive and it's very plastic. So... It has these properties of elasticity and plasticity, and it has the ability to hold a shape. And that's what makes physical changes really possible and permanent. Okay. Okay? So, you know, any disorder in that soft tissue system can come from a physical and emotional trauma, mm-hmm. you know, infection, mm-hmm. diseases, poor habits of posture and movement, stress, you know, just the wear and tear of everyday living. Mm-hmm. And um, so this starts deteriorating the tonal balance and the overall organization in the entire my- myofascial system. Okay. So that's, that's just a little bit of the science so that people okay. know that's what we're working with, the plasticity of the body. Okay. Thanks. So that's, that's a really good point. It's the myofascial system that yeah. you're actually working to realign and rebalance and sculpt into a more balanced, organized whole um, of integration that actually works with gravity as opposed to um, being disintegrated by gravity. Exactly. And, <laughs> so, and I want okay. to say one more thing, but as these restrictions are released, you know, mm-hmm. by my hands or the, my arm or the my the movement is going to become a lot more coordinated and refined. The body starts feeling light, mm-hmm. roomy, and hmm. at ease. I and, like then, that. and then things like flexibility, range of motion, joint stability, all of this improves. Cool. And then okay. the, the system is better to handle, able to handle all kinds of stress much more effectively and easily. Okay. Great. Ooh, this is very exciting. So, you know, it, it truly, it, it's such a transformative process. That's why I want the, you know, the listeners to really understand that this work is deeply embedded in the biochemistry of the body and really understanding how this connective tissue just surrounds everything and interconnects everything to everything in the body. Mm-hmm. And that's why we can start giving it a new shape, and we're doing it with respect to aligning it in the gravity field. And then once that's happened, once we get like, let's say, for example, you're looking at a dog and you, from the ground or from the side, from the profile, okay. you can draw a vertical line right up the front legs and up through the middle of the shoulder and you can see how that lines up. You know, are those legs right underneath the shoulder? 
Mm -hmm. getting its support from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the hind legs. And, and what about the torso? Can you draw a midline through the torso and see that nice long top line? Mm -hmm. Is the neck and head extending out of those shoulders nicely? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is a reality. That blueprint exists in the human and in every animal in our animal kingdom. Okay. And so I think raw furs, that's our specialty. That's what we do. Mm. Wow. Thank you. That's a very good base understanding of what you're actually talking about. Thank you for going through that for us. As I know, I learned a lot. I've known about roffing for a long time. I've had friends who have been roffed, haven't done it personally. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I, I think uh, <laughs> I got scared way back in the beginning because the first my roommate was doing roffing, and the roffer that she was using uh, w believed in pain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he, she, it was just killing her to go through these. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I'm not a big fan of pain, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> you know, about when... Um, I have to be really honest with everyone and just say um, that it seems like in every community there might be someone working in a way that I feel may not be as respectful to the rate of change of each person's structure. Mm, yeah. And that that's when you have this intense sensation of pain. Okay. And I hate to say it, but... A lot of the early work or the lack of understanding about trauma and the nervous system mm -hmm. just created this early aura of trauma, of pain around Rolfing. Right. And one of my goals in writing this book about animal healing mm -hmm. is to show that how incredible Rolfing is in terms of it's not painful. You can do very wow. deep profound okay. work and alter the structure of a horse mm -hmm. and you don't see the animal reacting in a in a frightened or fearful way or mm -hmm. exhibiting pain. I mean you you just mm -hmm. wouldn't be doing this. Well isn't pain counter to what you're doing? So if the body is in trauma and hurting, doesn't it, it tries to defend itself. It tries exactly. to you know, it, it creates a counterproductive exactly. uh, reaction. And well, yeah and, and, I, and I have to say that at this Time in our evolution of body technologies. I mean, really, Dr. Rolf was such a pioneer. She's the grandmother mm -hmm. of all these schools of soft tissue and of the different brands of structural integration that have mm -hmm. flourished. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't that deep an understanding with many of the practitioners about how you can sort of activate trauma in the body instead of really dealing with it gently and mm -hmm. titrating it out of the body. Mm, yeah. And I think that because of all my psychological um, training and background and plus all the processing that I have done in my own work right, and my own growth, I really understand that. Yeah. So, And I think that because of all the, the work like of Peter Levine and the trauma work and there's such mm -hmm. a greater understanding of how the neuromuscular system works, Mm -hmm. and how trauma is literally stored in the cells of the body, we have a lot more understanding and sophistication now. And that is not the reality of, of, that surrounds Rolfing, even though there might be occasionally practitioners that work in a more aggressive way. Mm -hmm. The majority of the people working are not working in that way. Oh, good. So I would, I guess, caution our audience that if you are guided to do Rolfing, that that would be... Um, a question, I mean, it would be a way to assess and evaluate the practitioner uh, to be sure that they're the right one. Yeah. You know, if, they, if they're, if they you know, um, causing pain, then they're not the right one, mm -hmm. I would, I'd have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a story, Bria? Tell us something that I, I know I have a picture here in my, uh, in uh, from the materials you gave me today um, about you working with an eagle. How did that come to happen? I mean, it's... It's just so amazing to me, and the story uh, and the picture is amazing. It's well, gorgeous. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a little bit in time because okay, uh, back I would say about oh over 20 years ago, one of my clients who was a um, triathlete okay. uh, was working volunteering at a place where there was a golden eagle that had been shot through the right wing and up through mm. the right eye, and he was trying to get it to fly to the to the mm. glove and 
the bird couldn't do it very well. Mm -hmm. And so one day, Dennis asked me if I would be willing to come out and rolf this golden eagle. And wow. I thought, wow, just to even be up close and maybe even touch it, maybe. Yeah. That could be quite exciting. And yeah. so I just, I just went with this attitude of, I'm not going to force anything. I, I don't even, you know, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get in that bird's beak. I don't want yeah. talons kind of <laughs> jabbering into me. But I went yep. out and I and um, I just actually approached the bird from the back. And uh-huh. you know, once I connected, I mean, I really had to work through this visceral, intense fear. Like, oh my God, what if the bird turns around and just takes a bite of my arm off? You know, yeah. that, there goes yeah. my profession. <laughs> and but, so I took a lot of nerve, and what happened was that I was able to connect, and I just stayed working, and within minutes, this bird was just getting really relaxed, and the wings were extending, mm-hmm. and pretty soon the beak was opening, and it was oh. drooling, oh. and it was almost upside down on the glove. <laughs> Dennis was holding it, and this went on for about, oh my goodness, an hour or longer, Wow. And there was a professional photographer there that took photos of every frame wow. that I was able to later have copies of. And it's wonderful. And, yeah. and it just really gave me this confidence that it doesn't matter what the animal is, that if they can feel the connection and they mm-hmm. know that yeah. you're helping them, you're in their nervous system and you just know that you're in and everything is fine. Wow. So it was very exciting. And so I got a chance to work with it two other times. Okay. And what happened was that this bird just became, went like from looking like almost like this bizarre bird into mm-hmm. a regal, you know, eagle once again. And that wow. was very, very exciting. That was sort of my first introduction into working with, uh, you know, birds of this nature. Really? Wow. And so I have to ask you, what got you working with animals? So you're learning rolfing, you're working with people, you're working with athletes and, and doing amazing work there. What made you go to work with animals? Well, when I got home from my training, and I had heard the story that I had a rolf one time was in Oklahoma, and there was this racehorse that was having issues, and she ended up, you know, rolling her sleeve up and getting into this horse. Uh-huh. And the horse won, went on to, to win the race. And wow. so I immediately okay. thought, you know, you can just apply this to anything. So uh-huh. I got home and I had a poodle and a and a schnauzer. Uh-huh. And I I just started, I figured out, I started applying the principles okay. of rolfing. And they responded right away and it worked beautifully. And then one of my very, very first clients um, is a national hunter jumper. Uh, guy, champion okay. guy, and one of his horses was lame, and yeah. the vets couldn't do anything. And um, Fred asked me if I would be willing to come out and work with this horse, and I figured out a five um, session protocol. Okay. You know, working two, to th- you know, at least a couple hours each time, mm-hmm. and ended up completely restructuring the horse. You wouldn't even recognize that the horse. And those those photos are in my book. Awesome. That it's the same horse, mm-hmm. and you know it was just, he was completely healed and went on to not ever have any more injuries. Oh, that's awesome! Wow. So that's part of what to think for the audience is that, let's say, even with a dog, mm-hmm. um, a dog that has let's say hip dysplasia, you mm-hmm. know, really bad, yep. and you know sometimes that shows up really early on. And I've had clients bring me their dog that was. The, three years old, and show me x-rays where it was just severe hip dysplasia. Mm. And even, let's say, in a, in a lab, I remember a yellow lab that I rolfed mm-hmm. very early on, so not even with a lot of experience. And I did three or four sessions on that dog. And that dog could go up and down stairs, could walk, could trot, could do anything, and you would never know it had hip dysplasia. Wow. Uh, one of my clients was a veterinarian, who's now in Montana, and she came. I showed her the x-rays, and she went and saw the dog, and she could not believe it. Wow. At that point, she was trying to get, I believe it was K-State, to do a research project with me Mm. around Mm -hmm. Mm rolfing dogs with hip dysplasia, and then she went off to Montana. But 
Huh. It, it, there's so much potential. I mean, not only with dogs that have congenital issues, okay. but let's say the animals that are, you know, they're getting on later in life and, you know, they've got hitches and they're dead long and they can't mm -hmm. run very well or they've got movement limitations or they get cranky if you pick them up or, you know, prod them in a certain place. Yeah. Two or three sessions already, major shifts. Wow. And then, of course, that impacts major shifts in their behavior. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I make, I, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if your body is not balanced, then it creates and introduces a chronic stress and nervous kind of an anxiety. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You, you've hit it right on the head. Right. And that happens with us as people. Mm -hmm. And then the thing, part of my message to people is that, you know, our animals are there giving us, you know, unconditional love mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And they're picking up on all of our emotional baggage and all our anxiety and issues. Right. They end up taking a lot of these patterns on. Yes. So that's another thing, that you start, you work on the animal, that shifts everything very quickly. And it's interesting because since I've published my book and I've gotten so many people come in that have never heard of Rolfing just because they've got an animal with injuries. Mm -hmm. And once they see even one session, the next thing you know, I'm Rolfing that person, I'm Rolfing mm -hmm. the husband, mm -hmm. the kids are on the waiting list. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it is that they've always heard that rolfing hurts. Ah. But when they see their animal just rolling over and almost guiding the session, mm -hmm. licking my hand, more, 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 kisses, <laughs> my new best friend, <laughs> yeah, you know, rolling over on their back so that I'm working in their deep abdominal muscles, uh -huh. they can see that it really is a gentle, wonderful process, and wow. then they see the results so quickly. Yeah. Mm. And, and it takes a lot longer for us as humans because yeah. I feel that at least 50 or 60% of what we're carrying in our body structures, frankly, is a lot of mental, emotional um, trauma or just holding patterns. Yes. And then when you have that, then you have the connective tissue contracting. Yeah. And we have that contracting and then you add injuries. Well, you know what? That gets the aging process going and then yeah. that gets people feeling cranky i mean yeah. the, living with chronic pain consumes a tremendous amount of energy yes it does <sighs> there's, there's another example i can give you which is wonderful i on monday of this week i roffed a 12 year old huge german shepherd okay and i worked with this dog a couple of years ago when it was really having a hard time getting around, mm -hmm. you know, lots of stuff in the in the in the hips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not unusual in the larger breeds and particularly with German shepherds. Mm -hmm, and yeah. I think I did like three sessions on that dog and you know, went great for a couple of years. And now, you know, the hips are really, really deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And um my client brought the the dog in about a week ago and couldn't even get up steps very well. It got 50% better. Mm. And after the session on Monday, that dog just went down the steps, two steps, and the other steps. It had just a lightness in its gait. Mm. And my client said, you know, probably my dog is only going to has another couple of months. Mm -hmm. But that's another thing to think of is that you can really affect the quality of life at this end stage, that they don't have to be dragging around and really whimpering, that you can alleviate a lot of that. It, it doesn't ignore the fact that they're in the end stage, but they can sort of go out with their boots on, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, I like that. And, and that, to me, is a really important message, that yes, you know, the death process is part of life, but... How do we age? How do we go out? And how do we facilitate that with our animals that, mm -hmm. frankly, are showing us that we can do this quite gracefully? Right. Wow. Oh, I'm so glad you said all of that because it helps us understand the types of issues that we can get help for ourselves mm -hmm. and that we can have our animals get help with. So mm -hmm. um, tightness and movement and gait issues. 
Mm-hmm. Hip dysplasia, I would think arthritis, arthritis. would certainly be approved. Yeah. Improved because if you take the stress off the joints, the joints can heal. Right. Right? Exactly. Um, uh, healing, of course, after injuries or trauma. Yeah. Um, you say something about this helps with separation anxiety. How does that work? Well, I think because, it, you know, a lot of anxiety, you know, like if I look at patterns of depression, and I yeah. looked at that with him, yeah. and they've done a lot of research about state trait anxiety reactions, is that that kind of tension is in the tissues of the body. Oh, okay. And so as you get the whole neuromuscular system much more relaxed and organized and you get them balanced, there's a certain kind of confidence and security that comes into the human and the animal. Oh. So, you know, it sort of gets them sort of rewired and connected to self. Oh, I love that. And that's very primary. And then, like Ida said, when you do that with respect to organizing an organism, you know, a body in the field of gravity, what you have and what you see are is like I see it in kids all the time. You know, kids that that are very shy or they have poor self-esteem or mm-hmm. they get picked on, mm-hmm. they go through the raw thing, even a four-year-old, and all of a sudden they're confident, they know more who they are, and this I see in, in animals. I see it in horses where they own more of their own space, you know, huh. in dogs too and, and in humans. Wow. I Oh, this is so awesome. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, so that would be how it would also help with other emotional issues like fear and aggression and yes. that type of problem. Yeah. So um, often, so often when I see um, an animal being aggressive, the first, the first thing that I witness is a fear, and uh, then they go into the aggressive mode. Okay. And I've I've had so many clients tell me that now when they go to the, you know, the dog park, their animal is a lot more confident and not getting aggressive. And I think a lot of it just came from sort of this basic insecurity. Mm-hmm. Right. This is such an interesting direction. You know, most most um, I think. Therapists and healer types and, uh, you know, those kind of practitioners, we look at insecurity and depression and uh, behavioral imbalances, but we take them as an emotional or an, a mental, you know, kind of a problem and they approach them that way. I know I do, I do that a lot in my work, too. Um, but when you look at the fundamental of what's going on in the body and see that they're so intricately connected... Mm-hmm. So you can approach it from different directions. And if, and I know, too, that if you get the emotional or the mental body to shift and be better balanced, yeah. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the body will follow suit quickly. You know, it, may, mm-hmm. it might over time, but the body has its own set of problems. Mm-hmm. So I, I really love that you brought that point out, mm-hmm. um, that the body is intricately connected to our emotions, uh, how we are in the world, who we are in the world, how we express mm-hmm. ourselves, how we move through the world. Mm-hmm. You know, like you said earlier, with grace and ease and lightness mm-hmm. of being, you know, or with pain and dysfunction and feeling heavy, literally with gravity. You yeah. know, your body's out of balance. You're having to constantly struggle to keep yourself upright. Um, it takes a great deal of energy and creates a lot of trauma and stress in the body just to live. I mean, I think the driving force of what propels my excitement and enthusiasm for rolfing, be it with humans or any kind of animal, Mm -hmm. is that as they get balanced, I see almost more of their true self, their true essence, you know, comes to the surface Mm -hmm. and can get expressed. And, And people will start discovering personality traits or behavior patterns that they've maybe never seen in their animal. Oh, that's fine. See? Because they've been so suppressed. You know, right. They've been tied up. And we're the same way. Yes. So it's this evoking of the, their potential. This is my passion. And I think this is something that mm-hmm. um, the listeners, I hope, they can get, is that walking is a very fast path for changing any problem in the structure. Okay. Okay, got it. I love it. Thanks. So, ah, so tell us some more stories. 
I want to hear more stories. Well, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share this other story because I okay. just got back from a couple of weeks of doing some training in Brazil. Cool. And I was at this resort on the ocean. This is where all of us were there. There were, you know, 30 Brazilians and three Americans and a European. Mm-hmm. But on this little grounds, they had two large white rabbits with some gray spots. Yeah. Well, at the at the end of day one, I picked one up and started getting my hands on this one rabbit. Uh-oh. <laughs> and this rabbit just loves the raw thing. Mm-hmm. And another practitioner who had been raw came over and said, I want to watch you roth this rabbit because I've got a Yorkie that has that can hardly walk. It's a 10-year-old mm. Yorkie, and I'm really getting concerned about it. It also has lots of other issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I did another session on, the, on this rabbit. And a number of days later, we were at the other end of this entire grounds, which is, they call it, a block away. Mm-hmm. And we came out in the afternoon from a, for a break from the workroom and here with the two rabbits. Mm -hmm. Now these Brazilians have been coming to workshops in Brazil there for the last 10 years and a number of them said, we've never seen the rabbits down here. Ah. And then I sort of bent down and I called over to the one rabbit and it just came over. Uh huh. It came over to me and I picked it up and we were supposed to be outside integrating in nature Mm -hmm. and I turned the rabbit upside down which is a very vulnerable position. Yeah. And this, and started talking to it, and the rabbit just closed its eyes, and the <laughs> lower lip was quivering, and people couldn't believe it. <laughs> and then two two nights later, I would go and do some final uh, work in the, in this one workshop area, uh-huh. and it was eleven o'clock at night. Okay. And I came out and walked to where would be my room, and twenty feet from the the room where I would be staying was the one rabbit, oh. and it was waiting for me, and the next morning we, I was leaving, and that to me was such a magical oh. moment, oh. because this rabbit, first of all, I went, we'd never seen a rabbit down there at night in two yeah. weeks, yeah. and how did it know where my room was? It knew. It knew. It could probably smell it. Uh-huh. And how? And it wasn't there at 11 p.m. when I left to go do this final bit of work. Mm-hmm. It was there at 11.30 p.m., And I got to say my final goodbyes, and that was, I didn't see the rabbit the next day. Oh, it completed. Yeah, and I I think this is like, it was so touching to me because this is the level of um, appreciation Mm. and love that animals can respond with. Yes. And they know. They know when they're being helped, and they show their appreciation. It was it was really a magical moment for me. Wow. Oh, that just brought tears to my eyes. I mean, there's just so many. And then I ended up, the, the my friend uh, Katia from Sao Paulo, mm-hmm. I ended up flying through Sao Paulo, and she and her husband and her 10-year-old Yorkie Cristal met me at the airport, and we went to a hotel, and I did like a double session on her Yorkie. Okay. And this Yorkie could hardly move at first, walk, mm-hmm. and was having mm-hmm. some seizures and was, mm-hmm. it was very kind of yappy. Mm-hmm. And by the end of this whole thing, Cristal was totally upside down. She mm-hmm. couldn't believe it. <laughs> and then we got the dog walking, and it was like an entirely different dog. Oh, yeah. You know, I would think so. This dog was moving like a young little dog again. And it wow. was a 10-year-old Yorkie, and um, she just wanted to really prolong its life is, and make it comfortable. I mean, yeah. this dog gives her so much. Yeah. So yeah. this is a way, I think, that we can give back. And then that's a couple hours of my time. I did kind of like a double session thing. I, mm-hmm. I figured I'd probably never be seeing this dog again Yeah. and just help it as much as I could. I love that. Ah, mm. ah what a great story. Mm-hmm. Ah, so, okay, so let's talk about... Um, the um, uh, some roffing do's and don'ts. Okay, let's okay. say roffing wa- roffing do's and don'ts, and what's helpful for, and what, when you should not use roffing. Okay, so you know, let's talk about <clears throat> what it really is helpful for. Okay. okay, just so that the audience can really understand. Okay, this is when I can do it. I'd say, like, if they're recovering from trauma. Okay. After the initial healing has taken place. Okay, so not immediately, but after... Uh, and sometimes you can do it immediately. Again, okay. this depends on the 
the experience of the practitioner. You know, okay. I probably would be in there doing it right away. You know, okay. A dog got hit by a car. I'd be in there working right away. Yeah. Okay. But um, all right. And then, you know, just correcting changes in gait, movement. You know, okay. Very, very um, amazing. And then, you know, correcting changes in behavior and attitude that could be training related. And so many of the issues these animals are carrying are kind of reflecting bad training. Yes. <laughs> Everybody uh, that's, trying I, to do their best, but sometimes we don't know how we to don't communicate know what we're doing. Yes, uh, that's, I get into a lot of that in my work. Yes. This is your work. So it you is my work. Yeah. Next we have, yeah, exactly. The animals are easy. It's the people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've got well, they to shouldn't call it animal educate. training. They should call it people, people training. training. That's right. People mm-hmm. training for animals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. then also another area is just this whole area of eliminating tightness in these older animals that get all tied up. Okay. And then on the preventive side, just how to maintain flexibility and suppleness in our animal athletes, you know, like the horses that are race horses or dressage mm-hmm. horses or the yeah. hunter jumper or the, you know, the eventing horses. That's Or, you know, the, you know, all the agility. Mm-hmm. Right, things. right. Um, the other areas, like for re rehydrating old scar tissue okay. that could be inhibiting movement. That's a very important area. And then just the overall pattern of releasing chronic patterns of tension or holding that can come from overuse or injury or fear. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, okay. Another one would be just aligning the muscles and the soft tissue in young animals to encourage the proper growth and development. Um, and just reshaping the body's overall structure. And if you do that, then what happens is that so often my clients over the last 32 years have told me, gee, they, their animal hardly ever gets sick. They hardly ever have to go to the vet except for, mm-hmm. you know, their well checks or, you mm-hmm. know, vaccinations, that kind of thing. So right. that I've seen is there's a very direct relationship between structure and function. Got it. And then as far as for... The don'ts of frothing, I'd say, you know, just, you know, generally don't use it for inflammatory conditions. Okay. Disease, you know, viral conditions, open wounds, broken bones, you know, blood disorders. Um, I, I would say those are the main ones. And, again, the experience um, and expertise of the rolfer will really come in in terms of really knowing how to work sensitively with these issues as well. Got it. Got it. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, Very, very helpful. And so now let's talk about how people can find a good animal rolfer. How do you find a certified rolfer who also works with animals? Well, the first thing I would do is um, go to the website of the Rolf Institute. Okay. www. RolfInstitute.org, okay. and then they can click on members. And you know, we have we have Rolfers all over the United States, Canada, all throughout Europe. You know, our, our international training headquarters is in Boulder, Colorado, okay. for North America. Mm-hmm. We have a training center uh, in Munich, uh, Germany, that's been there at least 20 years, okay. training all the European Rolfers. And we also have a school of Rolfing in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. Okay. So, you know, for South America. So I would say start there, and I think that any experienced rolfer can really take these principles of rolfing. And if that's an an area of interest to them or Mm -hmm. they've had some experience with it, Mm -hmm. I think that they they will receive some very good work. Okay. And I think more and more and more since now, you know, animals, when I first started doing this, Val, Mm-hmm. I literally had some people saying to me, what are you doing doing rolfing with dogs? You know, rolfing is, in, is not even known, and what are you doing? You know, almost <laughs> like I was giving it a bad name. Now everyone's into animals, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had to be, I was one of those, er, I was probably about the earliest pioneer developing this work or doing this work, and yes. it, it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't really received with open arms back then. Yeah. <laughs> but now we have people, I'm hearing 
people saying, gee, I want to go become a rolfer and I really want to work with animals. I'm yeah. hearing those stories more and more and more. Yeah. The other thing is that we have, there is the guild for structural integration. Okay. And these are people that have had really very, very similar uh, training and there's many of them. So we've, we've, there's a, at least between those two schools evolving, and there are other schools of structural integration that people can Google okay. and just look and check those sources because they could have many practitioners from these different schools in their town. Okay. And I feel that also one of the reasons that I wrote this book is that, you know, it's just the stories I think are really interesting. This is what the feedback I'm getting. Mm -hmm. But it's also got enough woven in there that any rolfer, even if they haven't had the experience, mm -hmm. they read my book, they will get it. They will say, oh, this is how I apply it. Oh, this is what she's looking for. This is what she's able to do. So the book can be also very instructive for newer rolfers or people that okay. hadn't really thought about applying the principles. Okay. I love that. And so... Let me just recap here. So to find a good certified Rolfer, um, you can go to rolfinstitute.org, mm -hmm. R-O-L-F, institute.org, mm -hmm. and look for members. Mm -hmm. I can also find out how to, how to become a Rolfer if you want. I'm sure it talks about that there yeah. also. Yeah. There's also the Guild for Structural Integration. Yeah. So that's the second option there. Yeah. And, and your book. And Google... Uh, schools of structural integration because structural okay. integration has become sort of the generic term and there's some other schools that are also teaching those principles of Ida Rolf. Very good. So the information is going viral. Yes. <laughs> we've, got, yes. we've got a lot more um, areas and interested parties picking up on these incredibly important principles and techniques and integrating them in other ways. Exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Now, exactly. how can they find a copy of your book? Well, they can go to my website. Okay. Which is www.briahansonrolfing-animalhealing.com. Okay, so that's B-R-I-A-H-A-N-S-O-N-R-O-L-F-I-N-G-animalhealing.com. Dot com. Exactly. Got it. Okay? Yep. Got it. Uh, and the, the name of the book is Animal Healing, The Power of Rolfing, right? That's yes, the name the of the book. Yes, Power of Rolfing, Structural Integration. Structural Integration. Got it. Okay. Wonderful. And I, I, have to tell, I have to tell our listeners, this really is a remarkable book. Um, it will give you a lot of great information, the wonderful stories. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. You're just going to have a great time. It's uh, a magical kind of an adventure. Um, so I, I just so applaud you, Bria, for bringing this important work to our animals and for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. And if I could leave the, the audience with one final yeah. thought, is that rolfing is so transformative on every level, be it physical, structural, mental, emotional. And it happens very quickly. Mm. So it just makes it a very cost-effective uh, intervention when you're thinking about one or two or three sessions, mm -hmm. oh. altering the life of the of the animal. Yeah, what I really love. Wow! Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I'm just so appreciative of what you're doing. Well, and I'm so appreciative that you are even doing a show like this that brings this level of information out to. People in the world. This is fantastic what you're doing, Val. I really Thank you. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, that was, this is a great place to stop, I guess. Although I'd love to keep talking, I would. I, I could keep you here all day, hearing more stories. Oh, this, yeah, <laughs> a million stories. Okay. Well, uh, so if our audience wants more stories, go get your book. Uh, go check out your work, and um, oh, keep it up, Bria. This is so needed. Okay, so let's call it here, and um, thanks again for being on the show, and we'll look to see what else you're doing soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. For more information or to listen to other podcasts, go to valhart.com forward slash blog. And if you're someone who values a non-invasive holistic solution, 
to resolving problems with your dogs, cats, and horses, and you want better behaved, healthier, and happier animals, just go to my website at valhart.com to apply for a complimentary happy animal assessment session. And be sure and remember to look for my CDs on iTunes. Learning how to talk with animals is fun and will change your life. So while you're there at my site, get my free Quick Start Animal Talk course and check out the world's first complete animal communication made easy system. May the love of animals bless you, teach you, inspire you, heal you, and reconnect you to the circle of life.